Hi, my name is Bramis, Chrome Developer Relations Engineer here at Google, and this is Unleash the Power of Scroll-Driven Animations. In the previous two episodes, I introduced you to Scroll Timeline and View Timeline, which you use to create scroll-driven animations. With the Scroll Timeline, you track the entire progress of a scroll container, and with the View Timeline, you track a subject as it crosses the scroll port. But sometimes you don't want to track the entire scroll, but only a part of it. Or maybe only animate an element while the subject is entering the scroll port, instead of animating it across the entire full view timeline range. Yes, you could play with the inset or you could adjust the keyframes, but that's not very scalable. Thankfully, there is an easier way to do this. You can adjust the animation attachment range. Let's take a look. Let's start with the scroll timeline. By default, animations using this type of timeline run from the startmost scroll position of the scroll container to the endmost scroll position, so from 0 to 100%. This is called the normal animation range. In CSS, you can specify the animation range using the animation range property. The default value is normal and it acts as a shorthand that sets the animation range start and animation range end together in one single declaration. As I mentioned, the normal range for a scroll timeline driven animation ranges from 0 to 100%. So the first normal can be swapped out by 0% and the second normal by 100%. It has the same result. At this point, you might be wondering why this is useful information. Well, here's why. Instead of those percentages that you see there, you can put in any length or percentage. So you can do something like animation range 100 pixels 50 VH. This way, the animation runs from the moment the scroll offset is at 100 pixels until it's at 50 VH. Let's look at an example that has a cover card that initially fills the viewport entirely. As you scroll down, the card shrinks to a fixed toolbar stuck at the top. In the keyframes that power this animation, there's a few things going on at once. The background position gets adjusted for that parallax effect. The height goes from 100 VH to 10 VH. The font size gets adjusted. And finally, the background color also gets set. If I run this animation using a scroll timeline, you can see that it works, but the range is off. The animation should not attach to the normal range, but to one that takes up one full screen. To achieve this, use animation range combined with viewport units. The start range is set to 0 VH and the end range to 90 VH. The reason that it's 90 VH and not 100 VH is because the height of the collapsed state is 10 VH. So you need to subtract the remaining 10 VH from the 100 VH to get to the 90 VH. So there you have it, a working cover card that shrinks into a sticky header. Note that the header is fixed positioned, not sticky positioned. That way, the maximum scroll distance of the page does not get adjusted as the card shrinks. If the scroll distance were to change by a scroll-driven animation, you would end up with glitching animations, and you don't want that. Note that animating the font size and such forces the animation to run on the main thread. That property simply can't be animated on the compositor. There are many other properties that also force a main thread animation including custom properties as explained in the link to article. External factors like a request animation frame can also prevent animations from running on the compositor. So be wary of what properties you are animating. For view timelines, the normal range spans from the position where the subject is about to enter the scroll port up to the position where the subject has just left the scroll port. This full range of the view progress timeline is also known as the cover range. 0% marks the start position and 100% marks the end position, as shown in this visualizer. That means animation range normal expands to animation range cover 0%, cover 100% for view timelines. When targeting the 0 and 100% positions, you can simplify the declaration to animation range cover. By tweaking the percentages, you can adjust the start and end positions. For example, by setting the animation range end to cover 50%, the animation will be finished by the time the subject is midway the scroll port. 
you can play with the visualizer tool I built by visiting the link shown on screen. Besides the cover range for view timeline, there are more named ranges that you can attach your animation to. Namely, contain, entry, exit, entry crossing, and exit crossing. Where the cover range tracks a subject from just outside of the edges of the scroll port, the contain range tracks it while it is entirely contained within the scroll port. For subjects that are smaller than the scroll port, contain 0% is a position where the end edge of the subject hits the end edge of the scroll port, and contain 100% is when the start edge of the subject hits the start edge of the scroll. Next up is the entry range. That is a subsection of the full cover range that runs from 0 to 100% while the subject is entering the scroll port. The exit range is similar to entry, but then for tracking the subject as it leaves the scroll port. These various ranges are exactly what I need to properly fix the revealing images demo I showed you in the previous video. Back then I used a temporary and a middle in nasty workaround that adjusted the keyframes. Thanks to the ranges, I can properly fix it by leaving the keyframes untouched while setting the animation range start to entry 25% and animation range end to cover 50%. This way, the images animate from the moment 25% of their boxes enter the scroll port up to the point where they are at the very center of the scroll port. And yes, you see that correctly. You are allowed to mix these various range names as you see fit, as long as the offset for the start range is lower than the offset of the end range. Quick tip, instead of using percentages for the range value, you can also use any length percentage value. For example, to run an entry animation during the first 250 pixels of entry, you can set animation range to entry zero pixels, entry to 50 pixels. You can also do calculations if you wish. So something like animation range, calc 100% minus 2 EMs, calc 100% minus 1 EM, totally works. I'm not entirely done with the animation ranges for view timelines. I cheated a little bit before and used only subjects that are smaller than the scroll port. For subjects that are taller than the scroll port, the interpretation of the ranges is a little bit different. This is because for taller than scroll port subjects, the start edge of the subject first hits the start edge of the scroll port, after which the end edge of the subject coincides with the end edge of the scroll port. It becomes more clear when I draw the start and end positions for this range. Singling out the entry range here, you can see what's happening. The animation runs from the moment the box is entering until it's fully covering the viewport. If you do want to run the animation until the element has entirely crossed the edge, then you can use the entry crossing range. There's also a similar exit crossing counterpart to exit that you can use. If you're not entirely following here at first, don't worry, because yes, this is complicated stuff. Use the visualizer tool to play with the various ranges and see how they behave. You can find the controls at the top right and I'm sure you'll get the hang of it. So, those were all the ranges that you can use with a view timeline. Cover, contain, entry, exit, exit crossing, and entry crossing. The cool thing is that you can not only mix and match these to run one animation, you can also attach multiple animations, each with its own range to one and the same element. As long as the ranges don't overlap, you're fine. Here's an example that animates all elements in the list when they enter the scroll port and also while they exit the scroll port. It's pretty nice, I think, as it gives you that native-like feeling. To achieve this, I attach two animations to each element. An animation that slides in the element, which is attached to the entry range, and an animation that slides out the element attached to the exit range. Both animations use the very same view timeline. An alternative way of doing this is to use one single animation attached to the entire cover range. Instead, the range attachment information is added directly into the keyframes itself. There's something to say for both approaches here. When using multiple animations, you can pull in existing keyframes from a library that defines these for you. While the single keyframe approach keeps everything together. Before I wrap up this video, just one more thing, JavaScript. 
To use the ranges with the Web Animations API, you pass the range information as options to the animation. Yes, that's right, the animation, not the timeline. This way, you can use one timeline instance for various animations that each attach to their own range. The values for range and in range start can be raw strings, or you can also use an object. Often, it's just easiest to use raw strings here. Wow, that was a lot, I know. Um, the thing you need to remember here is that you can attach animations to not only the full timeline range, but also to smaller sections of it. The tool that I use to demonstrate these ranges can definitely help here. Go play with it at the link shown on screen. In the next video in this series, I'll show you one more core concept. How the timeline lookup mechanism works and how you can create named timelines. See you there. Thank you.